director of the San Diego Gay Men's Chorus. We'd like to open tonight's um, ceremony with just a moment of silence to honor the 49 that were killed in Orlando and those that lost their lives yesterday in France. Could please stand for the national anthem. Thank you so much to the Gay Men's Chorus of San Diego. On behalf of the board, staff, and volunteers of San Diego Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Pride, <laughs> and also on behalf of our local community from those of you that are outside, uh, Willkommen, bienvenidos, salamat datang, alam wa saljan, aloha, Dor dobro pozolavat, Juan Gran, lascavo prosimo, yokoso, svagat, Juan yung mahamnida, karibu, josha madit, maligayang, pagdating. Welcome to the 42nd gathering of LGBTQ people in the city of San Diego. Here to officially open our pride festivities and offer a history of San Diego's LGBT pride is the head archivist at Lambda Archives of San Diego and associate at the San Diego Natural History Museum, Jen LaBarbera. Thank you, Jaime. Um, and I'm so honored to be the first speaker that gets to open this um, and welcome you all to San Diego Pride 2016. I am so excited to be here with you all at this rally, kicking off this full weekend of festivities and celebrations and maybe a little debauchery. Uh, I don't know, it's just how I do Pride. Um, as the, the head archivist at Lambda Archives of San Diego, uh, it's my job to give you all the history of Pride. I have three minutes to do that, uh, so forgive me that this will be a very abbreviated history. So, of course, we're gonna start with uh, Stonewall. So it's usually considered the origin of Pride, right? And, um, that's where our LGBTQ movement really caught fire in 1969. And let's be clear too that Stonewall was not a peaceful protest. We had already tried that. Stonewall was a riot. Our community, was fighting back against police harassment and raids on our bars and our safe spaces. 
And despite the fact that since then, our movement has tended to center cisgender, economically secure gay people, mostly men, the uh, Stonewall was led primarily by trans women of color, like Marsha P. Johnson, like Sylvia Rivera. So when we consider Stonewall as the origin of pride today, it's important to honor those trans women of color that are in fact our foremothers. So from Stonewall, uh, it became these Christopher Street Day or Pride Marches that spread across the country. Here in San Diego, our first official, by which I mean permitted by the city, rally and march happened in 1975. But one year before that, in 1974, our community marched unofficially, without a permit, without permission, we took to the streets. And of course, in 1974, and still today in many states across the country, people could lose their jobs, lose their houses, lose their lives just for coming out at a public rally like this. So LGBTQ people in 1974 that couldn't safely come out actually wore paper bags over their heads while they marched. Uh, so they could join up with their community, but still maintain some sense of safety while they did that. So fast forward a few more years from then, um, just a couple more dates as the years went on. In the late 1980s, we had separate lesbian solidarity gatherings, which were an attempt by the lesbian feminist community of San Diego to come together in a space where they could be visible, they could be front and center. And then... In the mid-1980s and early 1990s, San Diego Pride was also caught up in the AIDS crisis, right? So our celebrations were also protests. Our festivals were also memorials. This resilience has always been a defining part of our community. In 2011, San Diego became the first city in the nation to have a parade contingent specifically for military service members and veterans. And in 2014, San Diego held its first annual Trans Pride Festival, creating a dedicated space for trans people to celebrate pride within their own trans community. And these are actually all stories, yeah. These are all stories we have in the archives. These are all stories that you can come and hold in your hands when you read through care someone's caretaker's notes, when you leaf through pamphlets of outdated information about how to stay closeted in the military, or when you flip through ACT UP's flyers advertising mar protests and marches to demand action on AIDS. And then here we are now, today, 2016, and we're just one month out from the devastation of the Pulse shooting in Orlando. And these celebrations here are also protests. These festivals are also our memorial. Our joy here is all mixed up with the devastation of the killing of 49 mostly Latinx members of our LGBTQ family, and with the even more recent devastation of the deaths of, of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, the two latest black men killed by police in a too long list of names. Here we are kicking off our own beautiful Pride weekend with these hearts that are still a little bit broken and with this still present fear and yet also here we are still ready to party and celebrate and come together with the rest of our LGBTQ community because that is what we do. So we have come from great pain and great joy. We have come from great adversity and great resilience. As we go forward and celebrate this weekend, let's call on that history of resilience in our community, that history of being able to hold all of these things, this grief and fear and sadness, along with our love and celebration and joy, all at the same time, all in the same place. And so with that, I will wish you a happy and beautiful Pride Weekend. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you for that reminder that our celebration is born in struggle as much as it is a happy occasion for us. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our elected officials, their staff members for their continued and tireless support and advocacy on behalf of our diverse and intersectional communities, as well as our environment in the San Diego region. This includes the San Diego City Councilman, District, District 3, Todd Gloria. At the San Diego Unified School District, our board trustee, Kevin Beiser. Always a stalwart for our community, California State Assemblywoman, 
and Assembly Speaker Emeritus, Tony Atkins. A very special and heart well, heart well formed thanks to United States Secretary of the Army, Eric Fanning. For my own district, Assemblymember Shirley Weber's office, who has a representative here tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Chris Ward from District 3. He is City Councilman-elect. And Congresswoman Susan Davis from California's 53rd Congressional District. I'd also like to give a special thanks to the many City of San Diego police officers and County of San Diego Sheriff deputies. And while our officers may not always be popular, they always keep us safe without wincing. For those officers who are not yet on the plan, we still love you. <laughs> now. Before moving on to the presentation of the awards, I'd like to introduce two very hardworking members of our community. Uh, they contribute savvy behind the scenes leadership to ensure our organization is fiscally strong. It meets the needs of the organization and our LGBT community locally and improves year after year. Bianca Burt and co-chair, uh, co-chairs Bianca Burt and Romero de los Santos, thank you. San Diego. Is everybody ready for pride? Yeah. Oh. No, no, no. We need to start this over. This is a rally. We are all sitting here because of others. So let's do this again. Who sacrificed? Are we ready for pride? Yeah. VIP. Where are you? There we go. So I have the honor of presenting the Spirit of Stonewall um, Award. Go through these. And uh, let's go ahead and hold the applause to the end, if we can, of each awardee when we present them uh, the actual award. Here we go. The Spirit of Stonewall Community Service awardee this year is Tita Viveros. Born in Veracruz, Mexico, to a very conservative family, Tito, Tita Viveros reached San Diego in the early 1990s, fleeing the violence and rejection that forces many LGBT people to leave their countries of origin. Once here, Tita was empowered to help others in similar situations, especially the Hispanic LGBT community living in the Tijuana and San Diego area. Since 1994, Terry Albritton and Roger Sanchez have trained and given Tita the opportunity to facilitate support groups. And since 1996, she has been involved in community agencies such as Christie's Place, Pacto Latino AIDS Organization, Bienestar San Diego, the LGBT San Diego Center, Coca Tijuana, and, pardon my Spanish, Jardín de las Mariposas Tijuana. She continues to serve on numerous committees and organizations that support the LGBT, HIV, and transgender communities on both sides of the border. She currently works as a patient advocate for Pride Pharmacy in Hillcrest. For all of her hard work, we congratulate Tita Viveros as this year's Community Service Award winner. Accepting this award on her behalf is the equally fabulous Carolina Ramos. Spirit of Stonewall Inspirational Couple awardees are Denise Williams and Dana Topple. Denise Williams, go ahead, it's okay. There you go. Denise Williams and Dana Topple share a commitment to do their part to create a world where everyone is happy, healthy, safe, and thriving. The couple met 14 years ago. Holy cow. 14 years? Yes. 14 years ago while working at the Hillcrest Youth Center and both continue to volunteer and work with organizations and initiatives that support the well-being of the San Diego community. 
Denise serves on the board of directors at Christie's Place, an organization that provides comprehensive HIV AIDS education support and advocacy to women, children, and families impacted by HIV AIDS, and as an avid cyclist, has completed the AIDS life cycle, a 545 mile bike ride. That's a lot of miles. From San Francisco, to Los Angeles that raises funds to eliminate HIV and AIDS, HIV AIDS. Dana is the Chief Operating Officer at Jewish Family Services of San Diego, an organization that provides a wide range of vital human services to empower people of all ages and faiths to reach their goals and build better lives. Being the parents of an energetic, beautiful, loving five-year-old is the couple's proudest accomplishment to date. Everybody, clap your hands. Congratulations to this year's inspirational couple, Denise Williams and Dana Topper. All right. The Spirit of Stonewall 2017 Philanthropy Awardee goes to Mariah. Mariah stands for Metro Area Real Estate Professionals for Young Adult Housing. It's a group of local professionals in the LGBT and allied communities for, for who the past 11 years have been fundraising for the Sunbirth, Sunburst Youth Housing Pro Project, a program of the San Diego LGBT Community Center that provides safe and supportive housing for San Diego's homeless youth, including LGBT and HIV positive youth. Mariah's dedicated board of directors comprised of more than 20 hardworking real estate professionals produced three fundraising events throughout the year. Their signature David Yoder Memorial Casino Royale and Poker Tournament, Summer Stolces, and Harvest Town. The members of Mariah have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to help the Sunburst Youth Housing Project and are changing the lives of our youth. For all of their hard work, we congratulate Mariah as this year's Stonewall Philanthropy Award winner. I have a feeling this next awardee is gonna cause a whole lot of people to stand up, and I hope I'm right. The Spirit of Stonewall Service Awardee goes to the centers, hashtag, be the generation. Oh, come on. In late 2014, the San Diego LGBT Community Center launched the hashtag Be The Generation campaign with the goal of getting to zero new cases of HIV in the county by 2024. In the less than two years that the campaign has been active, it has already been incredibly successful in starting conversations about HIV and especially the new hope in HIV to help community members get past the fear and stigma that prevents so many people from doing things like getting tested to know their status. The campaign has become somewhat of a household brand around town. Somewhat? <laughs> you guys are everywhere. With the staff and large team of volunteers who continue to spread the message of hashtag be the generation in a number of creative ways countywide. Hashtag be the generation has created a huge, huge social media presence and the campaign's t-shirts have become very popular, which is evidence that more and more people are starting to talk about HIV, reducing the stigma and working together to end this epidemic once and for all. To all of the staff and volunteers of the hashtag Be The Generation campaign, congratulations on being this year's Stonewall Service Award winner. Everybody, can we clap our hands for that? Right. 
The Spirit of Stonewall Friend of Pride awardee goes to Dale Kelly Bankhead. Dale Kelly Bankhead is the Secretary Treasurer of the San Diego Imperial County's Labor Council, where she leads the over 200,000 working families and 135 affiliated unions of our Laker, local labor movement. She, continue, she comes to this position after many decades working on behalf of equality and social justice, including the LGBT community. Most notably, Dale has been active in the fight for marriage equality, serving as statewide manager for No on A campaign and its predecessor, Equality for All. Dale's work also includes leading the fight to oust the discriminant discriminatory Boy Scouts from their free location in the city-owned Balboa Park and serving on the anti-bullying task force of the San Diego Unified School District. Thank you for that. Dale has served on the board of directors of the San Diego LGBT Community Center since 2003 and held the position of co-chair in 2011, 2012, and then you came back, 2014 and 2015. Her list of personal and professional accomplishments are notable. And for all of her work, we congratulate Dale Kelly Bankhead as this year's Friend of Pride. Thank you so much. And now to the champion of pride the spirit of stonewall champion of pride awardee is sue reynolds there, there's that chw flag i see you chw i see you all sue reynolds is the head of community housing works if you didn't know a leading california nonprofit housing developer and owner of much needed affordable apartments based in San Diego. I hear VIP, come on, that's right. Under her leadership, CHW has partnered with the San Diego LGBT Community Center to break ground on the construction of San Diego's first LGBT affirming affordable senior apartment community. They just broke ground on Wednesday, July 13th. Sue moved to San Diego in 1989 to be with the love of her life and now wife, Allison Rossett, for whom she is always grateful. Sue has been a leading affordable housing advocate and builder of apartments in San Diego ever since Sue joined CHW almost 19 years ago, just in time to open CHW's Marisol Apartments, the county's first affordable apartment community for people with HIV and AIDS. Congratulations to Sue Reynolds on being this year's champion of pride and for helping us with the affordable housing struggle. Thank you. Our last Spirit of Stonewall awardee goes to our community grand marshal. So for this one, I would like everyone to stand up at the end and clap for everyone that's gotten an award, please. This is amazing. Michael Moore, as the current board chairman of Stepping Stone San Diego, Michael Moore has been a driving force behind the 40 years organization's recent turnaround. After many years of struggling financially, Michael's leadership put the organization back on track to continue its mission of serving LGBT community members who struggle with addiction. The need for Stepping Stone services is greater than ever. And Michael's goal is to bring the organization back to its roots focusing on the men and women who pass through the organization and whose lives are transformed by being free of drug addiction and alcoholism. Michael has served the organization for over a decade and under his leadership has, come, has helped ensure that the agency will remain strong and vibrant for decades to come. 
congratulations to Michael Moore on being selected as this year's Community Grand Marshal. Everybody, let's rate. Get up. This is a rally. Let's have some fun. Happy Pride. Now, here to introduce our next speaker is San Diego Pride's Executive Director, Stephen Whitburn. Thank you, Jaime. And thank you to all of you for being here this evening. I have the privilege of working with wonderful, dedicated volunteers and board members and staff colleagues who work all year long to create Pride Weekend for you, so it's really gratifying to have you here. Thank you. But let's find out if you're ready. Are you ready for a sunny, warm, picture-perfect San Diego Pride Weekend? Are you ready to welcome 19,500 out-of-town guests and create an $11 million impact on the local economy? And most importantly, are you ready to celebrate who you are and celebrate each other? You sound like you're ready. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. As many of you know, for several years, San Diego Pride has partnered with the San Diego Padres on Pride Night at Petco Park. Well, this year's Pride Night, a couple of months ago, will live in infamy. The San Diego Gay Men's Chorus was on the field to perform the National Anthem when the sound tech mistakenly played a recording of the National Anthem that was sung by somebody else. It was an upsetting experience, and it put the Padres in the spotlight as people voiced questions and concerns about what had happened. And at the center of attention was the CEO of the Padres, Mike D. Well, to make a long story short, I and many others were impressed with how he handled that situation, personally meeting with representatives of the San Diego Gay Men's Chorus and San Diego Pride, as well as other community leaders. This is Mike D's second tenure with the Padres. He was previously in the Padres front office from 1995 to 2002. He then went on to the Boston Red Sox, where he served as the chief operating officer. And then after that, he was the president and CEO of the Miami Dolphins pro football team before returning here to San Diego as president and CEO of the Padres in 2013. A little known fact, the San Diego Padres held their first Pride Night back when Mike D was here the first time. And that was before Pride Nights were cool. He's an ally of the LGBT community. He just made San Diego proud as the Padres hosted this year's All-Star Game. And he's making us proud again, as I'm guessing he is the first Major League Baseball CEO to speak at an LGBT Pride Rally. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Padres President and CEO, Mike Lee. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be with everybody tonight. Such a glorious summer night in San Diego. And Stephen, thanks for those great remarks and for your friendship over the last several months. Um, you know, on behalf of the Padres organization, some of whom are in attendance here tonight, and over a hundred of whom are walking in the Pride Parade tomorrow with me. I would, I would like to thank Stephen and everyone at San Diego Pride for your work in organizing this weekend and especially for inviting me here tonight. Fernando just asked me, have you ever spoken in front of a thousand gay people before? And I, I looked at him, I said, I tried to think, I, said, I don't think so. So it's a first for me and it's great to be with you here uh, this evening. And the spirit in which you approach this weekend is on full display for a first time visitor to this kickoff uh, party tonight. Your San Diego Padres are very proud to be part of Pride. You know, I was asked to say a few words tonight on uh, combating a homophobia in sports was the topic I was given, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but in a broader brush, I wanted just to look back at uh, some recent history, both here and around the country, involving sports and the LGBTQ community, and maybe shed a little light on opportunities that we can work together uh, to move forward. As Stephen mentioned, the Padres' history with the LGBT community goes back 
at least 15 years to 2001 when a group of us, and I was a part of it, organized what was then one of the first quote unquote gay pride nights in all of professional sports. A lot has changed since then with the emergence of the LGBTQ community and the term inclusion becoming a very big part of the world's vernacular. The world of sports clearly has struggled at times to keep up with the rapid and necessary change that has happened in other walks of life and parts of the world. And I stand before you tonight to commit that the Padres will do everything we can to advocate for the inclusion of the LGBTQ community into the mainstream of professional sports. There's a saying, it's easy to talk the talk, it's harder to walk the walk. We intend to walk the walk. In 2015, a group led by Padres ownership, players, coaches, and leaders from the San Diego Unified School District took a pledge to promote inclusion and acceptance in athletics for school-aged kids on the field before a game. I'd like to repeat that pledge back to you tonight. I quote, Beginning right now, we will do our part to promote the best of athletics by making all players feel respected on and off the field. We pledge to lead our athletic communities to respect and welcome all persons, regardless of their perceived or actual sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. Simple words, but a major commitment and one that we're proud to have made. Our commitment to this pledge remains steadfast a year later, and we live by these words every day. Major League Baseball has also been at the forefront of the inclusion movement, becoming the first professional sports league to name a member of the LGBTQ community to a senior level leadership position. Former Padres player Billy Bean became the MLB's VP of Social Responsibility and Inclusion in 2014. Billy came out of the closet in 1999 after his playing career had ended and he's led MLB's effort to promote and encourage LGBT professionals to pursue a career in baseball. As he likes to say, we are at our best when everyone participates. I know Billy personally, and let me tell you, he is an extraordinary ambassador, not just for Major League Baseball, but especially for the LGBTQ community, and we're proud to call him a member of our team. MLB's commitment does not stop there. Commissioner Rob Manfred said recently that the LGBT community is a part of the baseball community at a recent tribute in Tampa following the Orlando tragedy. As Stephen mentioned, the Padres were invited here tonight following an unfortunate mistake this spring that initially strained, but ultimately significantly strengthened our relationship with the LGBTQ community. Through this, we gained a much deeper understanding and a heightened level of sensitivity to the issues that affect you. And we are extremely grateful for that opportunity, thanking San Diego Pride, the Gay Man's Chorus, for your work and counsel and help in counseling us through what was a very difficult time, but ultimately ended with the sun shining brightly on us being here tonight. We're eternally grateful, thank you. Sorry I have to depart after I speak. We have 40,000 close friends down Park Boulevard uh, awaiting the first pitch tonight against the San Francisco Giants, but I look forward to, uh, hopefully we can beat the San Francisco Giants. We're 0-9 this year, so we need a little pride, uh, pride momentum. But pride events, including this event tonight, the parade tomorrow will be featured prominently on the big vid uh, video board throughout the weekend at Petco Park for all of San Diego and those visiting Petco Park and the Padres this weekend to see what is taking place in America's finest city. In closing, to reiterate, you have our word that we will eagerly and enthusiastically continue our work with all of you to ensure that inclusion is a prominent part of the fabric of your hometown baseball team. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful weekend. Take care.
A big thanks to Mr. D and go Padres. Our next speaker is a young person, a 16 year old transgender activist from San Diego. She's appeared on the Emmy nominated This Is Me documentary series, Transparent, HBO's Looking, People Magazine, CBN, France 24, and I Am Kate. That's a lot more than I've done. <laughs> she also speaks at school staff meetings and diversity trainings locally and is on the major's LGBT advisory board. She enjoys advocating for the transgender community and hopes to make positive changes. In her personal life, she plays competitive volleyball and volunteers for the Friendship Circle and Canine Companions for Interdependence. Welcome, Lily Rubenstein. If I had to sum up the LGBT community in one word that describes us, I would say pride. Pride has always been an integral part of our community. Our pride has allowed us to accomplish and succeed because pride unites us. Pride has always been our community's secret weapon because we know that we are stronger when we are working together. Our pride has helped us work together to solve the problems that we as a community have faced. Because of this unity, we have been able to pass legislation, stop discrimination, and raise awareness about our community. Pride has been a way to take our community out of the shadows and into the daylight so that we could have a voice and be heard. Pride lets the LGBT community know that there's a place for them in society and that there's a large group of people who are there to support them and look after them. Pride has not always been our way to show that we will not be silent, but also our way to celebrate being loud. Pride parades and celebrations are not just a party, but rather landmarks of how far we have progressed and how far we are going to continue to progress. So when we go out to Pride this weekend, take a second to remember what Pride was like before it was partying and celebrations. Think back to the times when the only way we could express our pride was through the Stonewall riots and other demonstrations. To when pride was something you couldn't celebrate because you had to fight. Now we use pride as a way to celebrate, but let's not forget it was once used as a way for our community to survive. Let's all remember that this pride, what the meaning of pride really is, because pride is most definitely not just a celebration, but rather the culmination of decades of fighting, protesting, and taking action for our rights as the LGBT community. So in order to honor those in our community that have fought tirelessly to get, to get us to where we are now, read up about some of our trans heroes like Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, and Miss Major, because these are some of the thousands of heroes that have given us the right to truly have an amazing pride celebration. We owe it to these heroes to keep their history alive, which is why it's so important that on Thursday, the California State Board, State Board of Education voted to introduce LGBT history in, in our schools. Last week, Lastly, to all the LGBT youth that is out here today, like me, let us remember that there, where, while there is time for celebrations, we still have a lot of work ahead. So let's be loud and proud about who we are. Let's work hard together to ensure that our generation will be the generation that will finally end the discrimination, hate, and intolerance, because we all have a bright future ahead of us, a future filled with love, passion, success, and freedom, but most importantly, pride. Next to the stage and an important fabric of our LGBT community is faith. Please welcome the Reverend Shane Harris. Reverend Harris is the founder and organizer of National Action Network of San Diego. He works with both the Western Regional Director, Reverend K.W. Toulouse, and the founder and president of the National Action Network, Reverend Al Sharpton. He was born and raised in San Diego, California in the Southeast region. Like many of the youth in that region of the city, he encountered the challenges of gangs, drug use, denial of self-worth, and educational development. He also had the additional challenges returning from the loss of both, resulting from the loss of both parents before the age of 16 and ending up in the foster care system for 13 years. Please give a warm welcome to Reverend Shane Harris. Thank you. Thank you. I want to also give a big hand to Stephen Whitburn, 
uh, and his team for their excellence in kicking off Pride Week. Let's give them a hand, a big hand. Let me say this as I begin that it is important as I began to think about the spirit of Stonewall and the history of the LGBTQ community's fight for justice and equality. And I think about the last few weeks. It hasn't been that long ago that we've both been fighting. When I think about Orlando a few weeks ago and what took place in that club, and I think about this past week, what took place in Baton Rouge, and what took place in Minnesota, and even what took place in Dallas. It reveals to me two things. One is that we got to stand together to fight the issues of gun reform and police reform in this country. And when I think about the history of civil rights and LGBT rights. I know what Stephen and me talked about weeks ago when we sat at coffee. It's time to break down the walls of the church and the LGBT community standing together and that's why tomorrow I'm going to lead out the parade. <laughs> Secondly, it's time to remember that it was civil rights organization fighting Dr. King and Viola Louisa and many others who fought for the rights of the voiceless of this country. And it was the LGBT community in the time of Stonewall fighting police brutality, fighting injustice, that it was in that time that the LGBT community found a fight and learned some of the fight from the civil rights movement. It's time to bring the movements back together and that's what I'm calling on today. So, what are we gonna do? We are in the middle of a constitutional crisis. I watched on TV after Orlando, pastors and Texas governor and conservatives got on and said, that the LGBT community deserved what happened to them in that club that night. But that's not the truth that I know. They said that God sent his wrath. I come to set the record straight to all those conservatives and pastors who tried to slander God's name. That is not the love of God and we've got to turn the message around and we got to start here. So I slammed those pastors that night. And I said that we will not represent that kind of hate and that kind of conservative region thinking. Secondly, we watch conservatives argue with liberals and those Democrats who sat in on the House floor about gun reform. It's time that we stand together because when we watched Alton and Philando Castile, when we watch what happened to Orlando, we know that we've got to fight for gun reform and police reform in this country. And if it takes every breath in my body, we are gonna do it together. So, tomorrow, when I echo our national founder and president, many said, Reverend, you're taking too much of a risk. Well, I guess you can call this a risk because when I fight, I'm fighting with everyone. We are stronger together than we are apart and the people united will never be defeated. We will win, we will get through, and we will fight. So finally, as I leave you today, we've got to partner on two things. One is that we got to get solid gun reform in this country. What happened in that club that night should not have happened. Gun reform is a problem until those who are opposing the conservative message get their hands on a gun. It wasn't a problem to have a gun until the Black Panthers got a gun. It wasn't a problem to have a gun 
until LGBT communities fought police brutality. It's time for us to deal with gun reform in this country, and if it counts every breath on our body, LGBT community and civil rights organizations will partner to get solid gun reform passed in this country. Secondly, there's no reason in the world why we can't come up with solid police reform. What identifies a police officer being so scared that he has to shoot a man six times while he's on the floor. Something is wrong with that. And we got to frame the narrative together. We can't do it apart. So we want solid gun reform. And we want independent investigations on civil rights cases. We cannot trust local prosecutors to prosecute local police. And we've got to start with our community standing together and fighting. But finally, it's time to break down the walls between the black church and the LGBT movement. And I'm gonna set the record straight if it counts every breath in my body. But I need your help. We got to continue to fight together until we set the record straight. And that's why tomorrow, when Nan and others are or join me in the car contingent, and we stand with Governor Newsom and Assemblymember Atkins, and we set the record straight with us marching in the parade. They say it's a risk for me. Well, I guess if it's a risk, I'm doing something right. We gonna fight together, and we gonna break down the walls. LGBT gonna stand with civil rights. Civil rights gonna stand with black churches. Churches are gonna stand together. We gonna fight with labor until we get the progressive message right. And when we fight, we win. Say it, when we fight. We win. When we fight. We win. When we fight. We the people united will never be defeated and we got to set the record straight starting today. Thank you. Big round of applause for Reverend Harris is in very very true words, very real words. Our next awardee lives at the intersection of disability and bisexuality. Using her voice to challenge societal beliefs in spaces where both communities often go unseen. She facilitated the San Diego Bisexual Forum and started the first bi-positive coming out group at the center. Currently, she is a dedicated member of San Diego Pride's accessibility team, making sure that disabled Americans and all are able to enjoy our parade. Okay, she writes the blog, People Aren't Broken, and is a chief financial officer for Disability Rights California's Board of Directors. In acknowledgement of her contributions, Jen was named one of eight LGBT disability rights activists of no by after Allen and was invited to the White House. Please welcome Jennifer Russell. Before I get started, I want to honor a group of people that often doesn't get recognized, and that is the hardworking staff of the Pride Office who is there. Every time you call up, panicked about something related to this event, so can we please cheer them, guys? So I'm going to tax your imaginations for a little bit. So imagine a cup. It holds 16 ounces, and it has 8 ounces of water in it. And let's think about this cup as my disability. Some people are amazed at the things I do, ordinary things, cross the street, take a bus, live by myself. For some reason, these ordinary tasks are raised to the extraordinary simply because they're done by a person with a disability. And those are people who would say this glass is half full. 
And then there's another group of people who see my life as tragic. It must be so awful to be blind. Your life would be so much better if you could see. Don't you wish you could see? And for them, I think they would see this cup as half empty. But my question to you tonight is why can't it just be half a glass? In other words, why can't the disability just be a fact instead of endowed with all that positive or negative meaning that society seems to tie it down with and then unfortunately force people with disabilities to deal with? Okay, now let's think about this glass as my bisexuality. And we're gonna pretend I'm a, that mythical creature, that person attracted equally to more than one gender her entire life without it ever changing one little tiny bit. <laughs> and now I know where all the bi people are. <laughs> um, some people would say I'm half straight. Some people would say I'm half gay and would just not even notice I exist because I blend to the background of the heterosexual or homosexual community. And my question to you in relation to this glass of mine is why can't it just be a glass of liquid? Why can't it just be bisexuality not cut into pieces of heterosexuality and homosexuality? One of the places where we see this cutting often is unfortunately LBGT serving organizations where we can go for our same gender attractions but where we're often expected to go someplace else for our different gender attractions. And guess how well that's working? The um, bi community, believe it or not, is the largest segment of the LBGT population. We're also the least likely to be served by LBGT serving organizations. And our isolation and alienation is leading to some really, truly scary statistics. When you look at the lesbian and gay community and you compare it to the bi community, we have greater rates of suicide, depression, and I'm not just talking like a couple points, I'm talking like big. Poverty, intimate partner violence, poor health outcomes, the list goes on. So. Okay, let's go back to this glass of mine because you probably forgot it existed, right? Um, and I want you to think a little bit about the trans community and their fight for the right to use the bathroom of their choice and for people to honor the identities that they've chosen. And our community has been great showing support for that particular cause. What if we extended that to people with disabilities? allow them to define how they feel about their disability. Let them decide if it's a negative or positive, and then just go with that and not tell them their lives are either amazing or tragic, just because that's how you might feel about it. Why can't, the bisexual, why can't bisexual people just be bisexual people, not dissected into what part's heterosexual and what part's homosexual and what part's the sub Why can't we just be whole people? Just attracted to more than one gender. And the most important thing is that when somebody, I don't care who it is, I don't care if they're bi, disabled, transgender, African-American, poor, anything. When they tell you who they are, we need to start listening and honoring that instead of trying to tell people who they should be and who we think they are. Thank you. Strong round of applause for Jen Russell, everybody. Now to welcome our next very awesome speaker, Fernando Lopez. Hola, buenas tardes. Me llamo Fernando Lopez. You ready for Pride? From Jose Saria to Harry Milk to Eric Fanning, LGBT active duty service members, veterans, and Department of Defense civilians have been a crucial part of the fabric of our movement, this city, and our nation. In 1974, the very first Pride marches here in San Diego in the streets of downtown had active duty service members wearing paper bags over their heads as they feared for their lives 
not just their careers, but their very livelihoods. San Diego Pride made history in 2011 when over 200 active duty service members from every branch in the military marched in our parade before the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell went into effect. In 2012, San Diego again made history as the Department of Defense allowed service members to wear their uniforms in San Diego Pride and over 400 out and proud LGBT individuals were free to walk in the light of day as their full and authentic selves. Today, we again make history as we welcome the highest ranking military official who has ever participated in a parade, in pride, and they're doing it right here in San Diego. Please welcome to the stage, openly gay, Secretary of the U.S. Army, Eric K. Manning. I can hear you, but I can't really see you. They have me staring right into the sun. Um, thank you, Fernando, for that. Uh, thank you in particular for keeping it brief. Thank you, San Diego. Uh, it is great to be here, and I don't say that just because we were in El Paso, Texas yesterday where it was 108 degrees. And uh, don't listen to them when they tell you it's a dry heat. Uh, it's great to be a pride in San Diego in particular because this is a city known for its commitment to diversity. Though I imagine few of you thought diversity would play itself out this year, in the form of a Navy town inviting an Army Secretary. <laughs> it's an honor to be with you and to represent the United States Army, more than 1.4 million Americans, active duty, guard, reserve, civilian, contractors, and their families. For many in our military, Pride in San Diego has a special meaning. While today they take part in Pride celebrations around the world, it was here in San Diego where soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines first marched proudly in their service uniforms. With their actions, they sent a clear message to our country that it's possible to take deep pride in being part of two great families, the U.S. military and the LGBT community. It seems like a long time ago, back in 1993, when I started as a junior aide in the Pentagon, that was the year Don't Ask, Don't Tell was put in place. I often wondered whether I was the only gay in a building of 25,000 people. <laughs> I had some great colleagues and mentors, but as I looked above me, I didn't see anybody like me. And as I contemplated a future in national security, there didn't seem to be many opportunities. But because of so many of you, because of tireless LGBT advocates, because of citizens like our awardees tonight, there are many more opportunities to serve, to contribute, and to live with integrity. <laughs> this summer, we've had too many reminders of men and women whose lives are threatened because of who they are or what they do for a living. After the horror in Orlando, after weeks of tragedy in too many parts of our country, and after last night's brutality in France, celebrating pride feels bittersweet. This evening, our hearts go out to the people of Nice and the nation of France, to people who have always fought beside us and for our shared values. And it's our commitment to make those values real that brings us here tonight. So we should come together, even as we grieve and mourn because we respond to acts of cowardice with acts of confidence, with acts of pride in who we are and what we believe. Celebrating pride with you this evening, I remember especially those we lost in Orlando. They were attacked on what was Pride Weekend in my hometown, Washington, DC. The very moment we came together across our city in celebration, members of our community in another city were senselessly killed. It's hard to put into words the pain and heartache we all feel for the fallen, the injured, their loved ones. 
to wake up to the news of Orlando, the day after such a joyous celebration in DC, left us all the more stunned. For our Army family, the events were especially wrenching. We learned soon after the attacks that among the dead in Orlando was one of our own, an American soldier, Captain Tony Brown. His commander recalled that Tony, quote, faced any and all challenges with a smile on his face and an unwavering spirit that everyone in our unit cherished. We grieved again when we later discovered that another member of our family, Angel Condelario Padro, who had served in the Army Reserve and Guard, was also among the victims. But we took some solace and pride that another member of our military family was a hero that night. Imram Yusuf, a 24-year-old Marine Corps veteran, was working at Pulse and is credited with saving up to 70 lives. As I thought more about the stories of other victims and survivors from that night and this summer, the heroes and the first responders, I thought again about my invitation to come here to San Diego. I thought about why it was important for me personally to be here, to help promote progress and advance acceptance, acceptance the attacker in Orlando sought to destroy. It was because of Orlando that I wanted to come to San Diego and why I finally agreed. And as horrific as this attack was, it was more than an attack on Orlando. And it was more than an attack on the LGBT community. It was an attack on America. In these days and weeks since, citizens have come together to mourn those we lost, to help those who survived, and to comfort those left behind. If there's one silver lining in times of grief and mourning, it's that we have a better grasp of this enduring truth that we're all in this together. It's a truth that's essential to America's success and to our military's success and future. To meet the complex security challenges of today's world, we need to draw upon America's best and from every background. To provide security for our people and nation, we need many different perspectives on the problems we face. When I look at the strength and effectiveness of our military, I see diversity and inclusivity as absolute necessities. We relate to pride. We relate to pride at the Pentagon. But I remember well our first pride event there in 2012 and how emotional it was for everyone. For those of us who had celebrated many prides in many places and for many others who were able to celebrate for the first time ever. To do it at the Pentagon had special meaning. But before we even did so at the Pentagon, troops at Bagram in Afghanistan had already gathered together to celebrate Pride Month. It should not have surprised us, or anyone, that our soldiers led the way. Today, the celebration of Pride stretches across the globe. To wherever soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marine serve this nation. Yes, San Diego, through your U.S. military, pride truly does unite the world. But the story of how we solve problems as a military is about more than the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. It's about more than opening up combat roles to women, or even our most recent step forward, opening military service to trans Americans. It's a larger story about how the military tackles issues that others consider too big and too difficult. Desegregating after World War II, 16 years before the Civil Rights Act, or integrating, integrating women into our military where they earn equal pay years before they were welcome in boardrooms. When critics said our military was too set in its ways, too big, or too afraid to move forward with change, our men and women in uniform proved them wrong. In the process, they proved what's right about our country. Today, when critics say the military is not a place for social experimentation, they might be right. But equality and inclusivity are not experiments. 
They are American values. Our military's ability to move forward should give us all confidence as a country that though our struggle continues, we can find solutions together. As President Obama said after the court's decision on marriage equality, quote, real change is possible. Shifts in hearts and minds are possible. But the president was also quick to remind us of this. Those of us, quote, who have not always enjoyed the full liberty that this amazing country of ours has to offer, we've got to be thinking about others who are still struggling. The president laid out the challenges as only he could. That if you're experienced being on the outside, you've got to be one to bring more folks in, even once you are inside. So as we celebrate what we've achieved, let's remember that responsibility across our country, across our society. Let's recommit to what has brought our community and country this far, to the values of inclusivity, tolerance, and diversity, values which are the very fabric of our nation. And always let's remember the men and women who agree to give their lives so that we can live free lives. By making these commitments together, by realizing that we're all in this together, we'll make sure the gains we've made continue for those who come after. Together, let's expand these gains for those who haven't yet shared in them. And let's ensure a new generation of Americans can write its own chapter of our journey towards greater equality and opportunity for all. Thank you again, San Diego. Happy Pride. I'll see you at the parade. And I can't resist. Go Army, be Navy. Another warm thank you for Secretary Fanning and all of those members of our armed service community in San Diego. Thank you so much. Now, from the San Diego Unified School District Director of Visual and Performing Arts, our very own Pride Youth Marching Band Director, Russ Burley. Hey, everybody. Did you ever wonder if your high school band director was gay or lesbian? Well, newsflash, a lot of us are. A bunch of us were watching the parade a few years ago and we said, you know, we've got so many amazing kids in our programs, we ought to invite them all to come together, volunteer and put a band together and march in the Pride Parade. And that's exactly what we did last year. Did you see us? We got a little wet. But I'll tell you what, these kids have resilience. They got better the wetter they got. They were amazing. So I really have to thank my employer, the San Diego Unified School District, for partnering with us to help put this band together. But these are kids from throughout San Diego County that have volunteered to be in the band. You're seeing about a third of them. Tomorrow you'll see all of them. And they're glorious. So please, I and I want to thank our district, because they're helping us with the transportation, a lot of that stuff. And that stuff wouldn't have happened with our trustee, Kevin Beiser. So thank you, Kevin, for that. Please give a warm welcome to the San Diego Pride Youth Marching Band.
So let all your problems melt like lemon drops. And thank you all so much for attending tonight's Pride Rally. We hope to see you tomorrow at our annual and historic parade where we urge the crowd to fall in behind our last contingent and march with us to the festival grounds where Kesha will be headlining Saturday night and Paul Oakenfeld will headline Sunday evening well, along with many more LGBT performers. We hope to see you there See you tomorrow. Happy Pride, everybody.